He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of London and the American College of Physicians and immediate past president of the Association of Consultant Physicians of Jamaica. He's a senior consultant at the KPH, Kingston Public Hospital, Surrey, and associate lecturer in neurology at the University of the West Indies. He's president of the Jamaican League Against Epilepsy. In 2009, the American Academy, Academy of Neurology selected him for the Donald M. Palatushi Advocacy Leadership Forum, and in June 11, he received the prestigious fifth annual Strabelius Lectureship and Award from Yale University in recognition of his work in the field of epilepsy. Well then, Amazon, I didn't know about that. That's fantastic. Relevant to today's talk, some of his recent international publications have examined knowledge and attitudes towards epilepsy in Jamaica, as well as quality of life issues in people affected by this condition in Jamaica. And he's going to talk about cognitive, behavioral, and psychiatric issues in epilepsy and psychogenic non epileptic seizures, which I think we all want to learn a bit more about. Thank you so much, Amazon. Thank you, Mary. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I must say, first of all, that uh, the topic itself uh, changed slightly every time I saw it in the, in, the, in the emails to me. But I got a general sense that I was supposed to talk about cognitive and behavioral issues in epilepsy and uh, with some uh, emphasis on, on psychogenic issues. Um, uh, I think uh, Winston may find some of what I'm going to say uh, particularly uh, useful, but I'm sure uh, everybody can relate to this through the patients that we all see. So um, how do I change this? Uh, I'll just have to play next slide. Oh, <laughs> right. oh I, I didn't. OK. I didn't see it, actually. So um, this is the structure of the talk. Um, we're going to do some definitions about epilepsy. Uh, we're going to examine the cognitive issues in epilepsy, then psychiatric issues as I've broken them down into depression, psychosis, treatment effects, the issue of suicide in epilepsy, and then the uh, very difficult issue of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. And finally, I'll tie it up by uh, examining the behavioral consequences of all of this. So uh, let's talk about definitions. Now, this slide may seem um, very difficult to, to digest. But what we're talking about is epilepsy is an electrical disorder. And it's a condition that has an ongoing, meaning an enduring predisposition to have recurrent abnormal electrical discharges. And this phenomenon in and of itself has major implications to cognitive, psychological, neurobiologic, and social uh, aspects of the patient's life. And as we know, epilepsy is a condition in which you have to have more than one seizure. You're allowed one seizure, but once you have two or more, uh, and two or more unprovoked seizures, and by definition, you have epilepsy. A practical classification of epilepsy is basically, uh, which one was the pointer? OK. Uh, breaking things down into whether or not the brain is normal by examination, clinical examination, or imaging, or whether there is some abnormality that you can define, meaning that it's uh, symptomatic of an underlying uh, process. This uh, axis here relates to how the electrical discharges start in the brain. Do they start in one part of the brain, or are they generalized across the brain? And as a consequence, you can have idiopathic partial epilepsies, idiopathic generalized epilepsies, symptomatic partial epilepsies, and symptomatic generalized epilepsies. And I've put examples of these different conditions. PGE means primary generalized epilepsies. Um, you know, uh, like childhood absence, what used to be called petit mal, or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy of Jantz, uh, an adolescent disorder, or um, just, just a situation in which the patient is normal physically, uh, cognitively normal, 
to a large extent, essentially. And um, imaging of the brain is also normal, but the diagnostic test is really that the EEG shows generalized discharges. So um, another example is, uh, uh, for example, a patient with a tumor or stroke. It implies that there is an abnormality in that part of, in a part of the brain, and the electrical discharges are coming from that part of the brain. That's just an example. I mean, these syndromes, benign occipital epilepsy and benign Rolandic epilepsy with central temporal spikes, these are pediatric or, and adolescent disorders that essentially the patient outgrows. And as you know, many of you would have heard that some people grow out of epilepsy. Well, these are the kinds that they typically outgrow, right? And those are diagnosed only on the basis of EEG as well. Um, so moving on. So remember, keep this in mind as we move forward, that you're talking of good brain, bad brain, part of the brain, all of the brain for EEG. And that's really how, how you need to think about it. So to deal with cognitive issues first, we know that uh, chronic epilepsy is associated with neuropsychological impairment. And there are many factors that affect cognition. An individual may be born with abnormalities of the brain. Those, those are the same abnormalities that predispose to seizures, but also can potentially affect their, their, their mental, high mental function. That's obvious. And we see a lot of that, don't we? Then there are educational restrictions. And I didn't put this in any particular order, but think about it. Somebody, you can think about your patients with epilepsy. The parents become protective. I'm just using a child or an adolescent, for example. They become protective. They, a child has a seizure. You keep them home from school for a week because you're afraid they may have another uh, seizure during that week. That dislocates their, their education. And equally, teachers uh, tend to be much more cautious. And all the people who are involved in the life of these individuals tend to uh, sometimes be inappropriately restrictive. And that obviously has effects on their cognitive development. Drug effects, think about it. Uh, drugs have cognitive effects. Many patients with epilepsy unfortunately end up on polypharmacy. By that I mean they're given more than one drug. And as we know, the cognitive effects of drugs are, are additive, and in, in, in some ways more than additive. And so it's really, really uh, an important basic principle of epilepsy management that we try to restrict drugs to drug treatment to one drug wherever possible. Just remember that one drug is always better than more than one drug. And then, of course, as the patients get older, um, there are risk factors that affect everybody in society that affect cognition. I mean, as we all get older, you know, we don't think as quickly or we're not as necessarily mentally flexible as we used to be. And uh, that is just something that affects everybody. So remember, also, another fundamental point, and perhaps a misconception, people tend to think of epilepsy as a childhood or adolescent disorder. But the prevalence of epilepsy rises continuously throughout life. And the highest prevalence of epilepsy is in the, in the elderly. So uh, if you look at, at cognitive function in people with epilepsy, and this is a slide that demonstrates it uh, graphically. Um, you can see LRE means localization related epilepsy, partial epilepsy. And PGE means primary generalized epilepsy, you know, those idiopathic epilepsy syndromes we talked about. There's very little difference in cognitive function between patients with partial epilepsies and primary generalized epilepsies. But both of those are substantially worse in all of the domains listed here. In intelligence, language, memory, executive function, and psychomotor function. So this is across the board. And in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, which is in fact the commonest type of localization-related epilepsy, you can divide them into three broad categories. Um, there, are, there is the category in which there is um, minimally impaired, and that's the gray line at the top, where you see uh, only minor differences, perhaps, in language and slightly in executive function and delayed memory. And the second category is principally where memory is affected. And there's a third category in which all aspects of cognitive function are affected. And the breakdown is roughly uh, 20, 40, and 40 percent. In other words, these cognitive issues are very, very prevalent 
in, in, in patients with epilepsy. Now, this does not mean to say that these patients are intellectually subnormal, but for the factors that we've discussed before, they are impacted upon. And our job as physicians is to be able to, one, treat these patients effectively so that they have less or no seizures and thereby allow them to be educated and not be restricted uh, as much as possible while recognizing fully that some people may have inherent things that they're born with that will make it um, difficult for them to achieve full cognitive function, but that those patients are in fact overall the minority. And I pause for effect because that is really the case.